This is Studio A. I'm Chaim Lazarus. Uh, America the Beautiful is a film by Daryl Roberts, and it's coming out on August 1st. Uh, just to give a brief synopsis, it explores America's relationship with uh, external beauty. Uh, Daryl, thanks for joining me in the studio today. Thank you. Uh, I'm also joined by the very beautiful and talented Kristen Haglin, who is Miss America 2008. Thank you for joining me in the studio today. Yeah, of course. Thanks. Um, let's just give a, a very brief overview. Tell me about some of the exact topics that the film touches upon and also some of the numbers that really come up in this film. Uh, basically, the film <clears throat> America the Beautiful deals with America's unhealthy obsession with beauty from the perspective that there are entities, uh, different industries that have uh, a self-interest in making us feel bad about ourselves so they can buy our products. So what I'm trying to do is give the message that we need to love ourselves the way that we are and stop buying into the hype. And so to do that, I dissect the industries, fashion, cosmetics, plastic surgery, um, and I show little nuggets of things and how it could not be in your best interest to over obsess in, in those different categories. So basically that's that's how we uh, structure the film. We use a story of a, a 12 year old model that you know, has been sexualized and exploited as a narrative through line um, to kind of illustrate all these different points. Mm -hmm. And uh, s some of the uh, issues that are, that are touched upon through um, the story uh, of the model and um, through some of the information given is, for example, you start out with, um, you know, going into uh, magazines and advertisements and how those might affect uh, a reader's psyche. And then you start going into plastic surgery. Can you just give us um, some of the numbers uh, of what, what, how many people are getting plastic surgery in America? What are the costs? Um, well, there's various costs. You know, you have anywhere from, you know, bottom end, uh, breast jobs that could run five grand, or they have some on, in Beverly Hills that can run like 30 grand. Um, some of the numbers, when you talk about magazines, one of the ones that I found kind of relevant is this was a study done at Harvard that said that three, three minutes, um, a woman reading a fashion magazine for three women, three minutes makes 70% of women in America feel shameful and guilty and not good about their bodies. Um, so, you know, we do things like that. Um, <clears throat> yeah, so that's one of the, st the statistics. Um, an another, another issue that you go on to later on in the film is cosmetics. Um, you bring up a, a very interesting uh, story of a woman who's actually fired for not wearing cosmetics. And then you go into uh, some of the chemicals that are contained in cosmetics in America and cosmetics in Europe. Can you just tell me a little bit about the differences? Uh, well, basically, Darlene Jesperson mm -hmm. worked at Harris Casino mm -hmm. in uh, Reno, Nevada. And, you know, she didn't want to wear makeup. So they fired her saying that makeup was a part of being a woman, basically. And uh, seven jury male... Uh, court judges ruled, you know, in the favor of the casino. Basically, the reason we showed that story is to show that, you know, this woman wasn't given a free choice into, um, you know, how she wanted to handle her body, wear makeup or not wear makeup. It, it was forced upon her, and being forced upon her, we show how cosmetics have these ingredients in it that a lot of organizations say causes um, allergies and cancer in women. And it happens so that these ingredients have been banned from cosmetics in Europe. The European Union banned them. But here in the United States, they review, refused because they said the uh, research and development costs are too expensive. Nobody can prove that it actually causes harm. So like the cigarette industry, you know, at one point they couldn't tie the nicotine to the lung cancer to till they did. You know, the industry in America always takes the position that, you know, well, we don't want to spend any money to do anything until you can prove it. Whereas other countries, they look out for their residents, you know, and they make the industry, they put the onus on the industry where you have to prove your stuff is safe before you can sell it. As opposed to here, it has to do harm before, you know, we do something about it. 
I think an interesting number that really stuck out to me from the film was that there, since like the 1970s, there have been six ingredients that have been banned by Congress to be put in cosmetics. And in the in Europe, there's 450 50. that are banned from cosmetics. It's like, well, what are we putting in our hair, on our faces, on our bodies that have, like one of the doctors spoke about, penetrating, that help help the chemicals to penetrate into your skin. And these are carcinogens, things that can cause cancer. Um, there are actually agents in, in our perfumes and our fragrances that help these toxic chemicals penetrate into our skin, into our bloodstream. Penetration enhancers. Yes, penetration enhancers. Yes. That was the term. Um, but that was something that really stuck out to me. And I even went to the drugstore this morning. I went to Dwayne Reed to go get a hairbrush. And I'm walking by all the cosmetics like, oh my gosh, phallets, phallets. <laughs> Think about and But it makes you aware. That's the good thing about this documentary is it helps to make people aware. And then they can stand up for themselves as a consumer, as an individual, You know, write letters if they, if they need to, if they want to, if they feel so um, empowered. But if not, at least they have that knowledge and they can tell people and they can make their own individual decisions, you know? Now, Kirsten, you, you don't appear in the film. Um, no. But, you know, obviously, uh, Miss America, beauty pageant winner, you've been very in- involved uh, with people, you know, judging you by an external appearance for a long time. Um, how, how, did, how did this relationship here come about? Well, actually, I have to say, I only did three pageants. I did my local, which was Miss Oakland County in okay. Michigan, and I wasn't expecting to win at all. Uh-huh. Like, I haven't been doing pageants all my life. Okay. <laughs> I never, Miss America was never in my plan. Uh-huh. Um, I did it mostly uh, on the local level for the scholarship because uh-huh. I was going after school to the University of Cincinnati and um, and for just to make friends and the journey and to kind of, you know, challenge myself in a way. And I know so many girls who've competed in this program on a dare, (laughs) you know, but um, I wasn't expecting to win. And then once I got into the program more and more involved, I realized that 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 pageant is the most glamorous night glamorous even if you want to call it that of the whole year because after that you're out in the community you're in a hands-on position you have a platform that you speak about I went on a, on a speaking tour in my county in my hometown in my community and I was 17 years old and I was not used to speaking in front of people but all of a sudden people were listening to what I had to say they were sitting there waiting for me to say something of value <laughs> you know and that's a little bit scary but that's why you have a personal platform and I chose mine to be eating disorders awareness um, because I personally struggled with anorexia and the first time that I had to talk about it in front of people was really really tough and I wasn't sure if I was ready and I wasn't but initiating that discussion um, talking about my own story but then receiving that feedback from people like wow thanks for talking about this and yeah I think my daughter might be struggling with that or men coming up to me and saying now I know a little bit my wife struggled with bulimia in college so now I can see you know and it is just normal people it is this person's wife it is it could be this person's son who's a weightlifter it could be anyone and people relate and everyone relates to self-acceptance self-acceptance issues so I have felt so empowered in this position because I am able to be in a position where people listen to what you have to say. And it's given me this opportunity to get to know Daryl through my work in the eating disorders community. Um, I was speaking at an eating disorders conference to professionals and um, they said, have you heard about Daryl Roberts, this great new film? And they told me what it was about, America the Beautiful and America's obsession with beauty. I said, oh my goodness, that's what I am all about. And turning the tables and destigmatizing industries and using the industry, the entertainment industry, to send a positive message. Because we do live in a pop culture. We do live in a celebrity-saturated world. You know, why not use that power, use something like Miss America, who young women look up to and pay attention to, to say, we need to think about how we treat our bodies, the way that we respect ourselves, and how we define beauty. And Miss America is a complete... American woman, someone who, you know, for is, is intelligent, who wants to spread a message, is working for scholarship to continue her education, and happens to have competed in a pageant, which is the tradition from 1921. It's that one night and the rest of it is a job. You're a businesswoman and a spokesperson. So through my work, I got um, connected with Daryl and through ANAD, which is a um, anorexia nervosa and associated disorders, a nonprofit group. And uh, we got connected. He invited me here to, the, to attend the premiere. And I feel so, so happy to be here to support this and it's what I am all about I'm hopefully going to attend the Los Angeles premiere in August and um, I just can't wait to encourage I mean and I already am encouraging young women to come out and see this film and to to respond to its message because it tells you that you as a consumer and the individual have the responsibility and the right to love yourself um, for who you are on the inside first and you have the the power to make those those choices if I may um, 
can you tell me a little bit about your personal experiences? Ep- and please. Sure. Um, I grew up um, dancing, doing ballet from the age of three years old, jazz, tap, and ballet, but ballet was really my dream. And I was always very passionate about the arts and about music. And when I got to be about 12, 13 years old, um, I decided I got very, very intensely involved in ballet, six, seven days a week, rehearsing all the time, and um, went off to my first summer ballet program. I became very heavily involved in the world and seeing these older dancers and what they looked like and what I needed to be if I wanted to be a professional. And I really wanted to, and that was always my dream as a little girl. And um, I started... To I, you know, your your body is changing. You're going through adolescence, and all of a sudden, I started to see that my body wasn't looking like that anymore. You know, like an 11, 12 year old girl, and I got very scared that my body wasn't going to be right. That I couldn't be, I couldn't achieve my goal and do my dream and to dance if I didn't look the right way. So, and I was a very perfectionistic type A kind of person that always wanted to be the best and do the very best that I could. And so, I compared myself to other girls and saw what they were eating, and and you know, went on my first diet to lose a couple pounds you know just oh and then and then I'll be fine well you won't be fine once that mentality starts to kick in every extra pound is another victory every food that you cut out is another little victory another step and then I received positive reinforcement from people from from my ballet teachers from friends from um, from other adults, from adults in my life, they would say, oh, you have such willpower, you know, and and because they just don't know. Um, and so I received positive reinforcement. So I continued to go down this path. And it became very, very serious when I was 16 years old. And I came home one summer, and I was much, much, much too thin. I was ser- uh, seriously depressed. Um, I had the only person I was in a relationship with was my eating disorder, because you don't want to be around food, you don't want to be around anyone else, no one wants to hang out with you, because you're always obsessing about food. And that's not fun. Um, and so I'd, I'd, I'd lost my sense of self. In an effort to try and hang on to my dreams, I'd completely lost my sense of self and who Kirsten was. And so my mother, who's a nurse, was the one who really took the step and said, we need to go see a doctor. And so I did. I went and saw my pediatrician, and they recognized something was wrong. Um, they said, well, she possibly you know, might have anorexia nervosa. So we went to an eating disorder specialist. I was diagnosed with this disease. Um, and then that was went on to hook up with a clinical psychologist as well as a nutritionist. That's my treatment team. Um, in order to get better because you can't just go see a doctor you need um, mental health treatment as well as a nutritionist to work with you on on a food plan so I got set up with this team and started on the journey toward recovery well now something very interesting which which I saw in the film was that you know like you said uh, this is a disease and Mm -hmm. a lot of people suffer with it yes Um, and people die from bulimia and anorexia Um, but what 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 shows up on the on the death certificate when people mm-hmm. actually do die from this disease? Um, the couple in the film it said unknown causes, mm-hmm. uh, but in the case of like Terry Schiavo who mm-hmm. died of an eating disorder, it was some kind of organ failure, and I forgot mm-hmm. which organ it was. Mm-hmm. So it's either unknown causes or organ failure because that's normally what happens, right? Your right. organs go out, or yeah, or in the case of of anorexic, your heart stops. Okay. You have a heart attack. Gotcha. Um, so it would say heart attack, yeah. for instance. So that's how <clears throat> they um, disguise themselves and hide from having real statistics on it. So what's the th- like if you go to the Center for Disease Control, how many mm-hmm. people would they say died of like one hundred and eighty-seven? Right, in when, a year, and it's way <laughs> more than that. But it's not you can't. They have no statistics, and I think the lack of statistics is what's keeping organizations that she's working with from being able to go to Congress and go to insurance companies and say, "Look, companies. how many people are dying from this?" You know, it's just not there. It's absolutely that's what I I was able to do. I was able to go lobby Congress in April for the passage of mental health parity, mm-hmm. um, one which would uh, demand or mandate insurance companies to cover. Um, health costs for mental illness in the same respect that they do physical illness. Um, but and, and mental health parity, they've been working on that for 12 years in Congress. And so it's finally gotten through both the House and the Senate in, Congress, or in conference right now. Um, we're also there um, introducing a bill called the FREED Act, which the first priority of the bill is to increase federal funding for research by places like the CDC and the National Institute for Mental Health so we can get those numbers and increase education. You know, so many doctors don't put that on a death certificate. They don't even recognize a 
girl when she comes in and she's faint and she's maybe about to have a heart attack. They don't recognize it as an eating disorder. Oh, you're just fatigued. Go home, get some sleep. Here's an antibiotic or, or something, um, you know, a quick fix. But they don't recognize it as an eating disorder because they don't receive the proper education in medical school about eating disorders maybe a week because they're not taken seriously. And the fact is it is serious. It is killing people. Now, um, correct me if I'm wrong, but uh, you took part in uh – uh, like a reality show with a whole bunch of yeah, at Miss America Reality Check last year, um, in conjunction with the with the pageant, we all the girls went out to LA and filmed in November this reality show. They had all of us living in the house, and it was interesting. I tried to stay out of the camera. <laughs> <laughs> um, now uh, that's of course you know a, a very interesting situation. You're mm-hmm. there with all these incredibly beautiful girls. They're all very much concerned about their external image. Did you encounter uh, anyone there who had uh, any sort of eating disorders? Um, I had girls, actually, this is really neat, that because knowing what my platform was, they approached me and shared their struggles, and we talked about it. And no, that opportunity was really a great chance to bond with the other girls, because we're all college girls. We're all the same. I mean, and we all are professionals because we all come from a state where we have a job and where every day our job is traveling around the state, you know, speaking in schools, um, and visiting children in the hospital. We do children work with Children's Miracle Network. So all of the girls, there's a respect there for the work that each other does. And we're about we're not prissy models. You know, that's not our job. Um, we don't walk red carpets and pose for magazines like that's not our job. You know, we're in the community hands on. Um, so each girl respects that. Uh, and you and you notice tendencies around food. Oh, yeah. Anywhere that you're with women, <laughs> you're going to notice weird behaviors around food. So, yeah, for sure. But that gives me an opportunity to stand up and be a role model. And actually, a really cool story. Um and, and I didn't mean it. I didn't do it in any kind of way to try and, you know, be a, a champion or anything. I wasn't. Um, but it was just, it was cool. Um, and there, were, there was this time in the in the show where everyone was getting a makeover, like a haircut and, a, you know, a makeup, which was supposed to, like, make you feel better about yourself, which I was totally like, no, <laughs> it takes more than a haircut and a makeover to make you feel good about yourself, of course. And the girls and I talked about that. Um But uh, a a contestant came over. We were all sitting eating dinner, and our director and camera guy were standing right there and trying to, you know, listening into conversations to see what they would, you know, then start filming and say, okay, have that conversation again. That's reality for you. (laughs) Um, And so when a contestant came over and we were all eating, she said, oh, we said, oh, come sit down and, you know, have dinner with us. She said, oh, well, I'm I'm nervous. She was getting her hair really chopped off, really short haircut. Um, no, I'm nervous. Um, I'm not, I don't eat when I'm nervous. And it wasn't like a, I don't think she had an eating disorder, but um, it was just something that she said. The director picked up on it, said, oh, camera guy, turn the camera on. Will you say that again? She's like, what? Say, oh, okay. And they're getting ready to film her say this comment again. He said, that's a good sound bite. I'm like, oh, no. <laughs> you know, I was like, I don't want that to be, I don't want young girls to hear that. So I just lightly tapped the director. I said, can we please not film that? And he's like, well, why not? You know, I said, well, I don't think that's a good message for young women to be hearing in this show. Um, He's like, you know, wasn't going to do it. The camera guy's getting ready to set up. I said, I tapped again. I said, please, no, my platform is eating disorders awareness. And I struggled with an eating disorder. And we really, it's just, it really is not necessary. And he said, okay. And they didn't. And they didn't end up filming that. And it's just small little things like that saying that. I mean, I've got nothing to lose. I'm not a, I don't have to work for my next job or whatever. I'm not going to get fired from the reality show, you know? (laughs) So I had nothing to lose. And so I stood up for it and said that because it's just small things like that. We don't want girls to hear that message, especially from people in a position of of leadership, you know? So that was really cool. But yeah, it was an interesting experience. Wow. That's, that's great. Um, If I can just go back for a second, can you tell me about, you interviewed all these uh, young girls, you know, these are the girls who are getting these messages, and tell me about some of the responses you got when you were asking uh, young girls, 12, 13, 14, 15, about their self-image and about their self-esteem. Um, <clears throat> you know, when I first started filming the, the uh, documentary, I interviewed 200 women, ages about 8 to, you know, 50 or whatever, uh, and it's pretty much the same, so... Out of the 200, one of the questions I would ask them is, do you feel attractive or do you feel beautiful? And only two said yes. And they blamed the images in magazines specifically. So of all the media 
it's the skinny models in the magazines that they all blame for making them feel bad about themselves. What was really interesting is, you know, because it was just common sense to me. I'm like, well, if that makes you feel bad, why don't you just stop reading it and put it down? And I'm like, well, no, you can't. I mean, you have to read it. So there's some kind of love-hate relationship with women in these magazines. But it dawned on me that it's possible that 99% of the women are walking the streets feeling unattractive. So that's what made me go to New York. I flew out here to interview the editors of all those magazines, since they said that's the cause of the problem, to let them know what I had found. And I'm thinking, well, evidently they must not know about it. No, I talked to the editors. They was like, yeah, you know, but you know, we're not social workers. Our magazine is not a not-for-profit. You know, we're here to make money. So they made it clear it's about the money. But that's overriding. Now, the younger they got, it got kind of bad because older women in their 30s and 40s, <clears throat> they were more intelligent about feeling bad about themselves. But the women, like the young girl who was seven, you know, in the movie, the younger they start feeling ugly. And like the girl at the beginning of the film, who she just insisted she was ugly. She's really attractive, too. And she's 12 years old. She can't tell you why she's ugly. I'm just ugly. And I'm like, well, who's attractive then? And what was really telling about it, when I asked her who was attractive, Beyonce, Aaliyah, celebrities. Nobody from real life. not Nobody from her family, friends, just celebrities. So I think it's the messages from the media in combination with celebrity culture mm. and is making young girls feel like they're not good enough. Mm. Yeah, I mean, I, I, I thought those, the interviews with the editors was really very telling. I mean, how completely unapologetic they were and how entirely aware of the situation. Um, I found, you know, completely, completely fascinating. Uh, another really interesting interview you had um, was with the advertising executive. Yeah. And tell, tell me a little bit about what she said in that interview that really tied in together the advertisements in the magazines and the content. Um, basically, you know what she really said, and it's in the film too, because she actually acknowledged. So the part that is not in the film is I'm telling her what advertising is doing and she's kind of denying it. So she says, well, it used to be that way where we present a problem and then we put our product out there as a solution. But, you know, we kind of don't do that anyway. And I keep giving her examples. So what's in the movie is she goes, well, there are two types of women. One type is the ones that super beauty involved. I mean, they wear all the products and they really like it. The other type... And they are like the victims, her exact words. They're like the victims in this. They have a very low self-esteem. They don't feel good about themselves. And they are the ones who end up buying all of our products. So this is an advertising agency that comes up with campaigns to psychologically, I call it, they psychologically uh, demolish women's self-esteem. You know, admitting that there's a group of women that don't feel good about themselves that they sell these products to. That was very, uh, very telling to me, actually. Mm. And she's admitted it. It's just out there. So, mm. yes, yeah, so many of these, uh, so many of these magazines will, of course, you know, have an article about a problem, and then the next page will be an advertisement mm -hmm. f for. Yeah. That's what people don't really realize how much advertisers control the um, editorial. In a magazine, I interviewed this woman. It's not in the film, and I wish it could have been. She was the writer from CSI. She's an older woman, and she talked about how advertisers dictate the ages of the characters on TV shows. So when they start a new television show, and that's why you see so many young people on TV, because blue-chip advertisers say, well, we want to reach this demo. Mm -hmm. What network television does, they go out and create all these different shows to get those advertisers on the show. So at the end of the day, because you hear people generically say, well, it's the media, the media. The media is just a vessel. Advertisers are really the ones wreaking havoc mm -hmm. on, the, on the American public. Mm -hmm. um, now, when you were a young girl, Kirsten, when you were looking up to older dancers. You said mm -hmm. that was uh, your biggest influence of what I wanted to be. Did uh, advertisements and magazines and stuff like that also have an effect on you or not so much? Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. Because it's what started as 
just comparing myself to older dancers and professional ballerinas, then I was doing my research and I was a good study because I was a good student. I was very type A. If I was going to do my work, I was going to do it the right way. So I did my research and I looked at the fashion magazines and I looked at what models looked like and embodied that or, or printed, imprinted that image in my head of what I needed to look like mm -hmm. in order to be beautiful. Mm -hmm. Like beautiful to me became something that was very, very thin and, and sick. And I see that now. And I, and now that I'm in a healthy place, it makes me so sad, but it, I've, I'm glad that I remember what that feels like so that I can help other girls because when I talk to them, I know exactly what they're feeling. I know what's going on in their brain. and But it helps me to realize that that is not what's important. It is not about just your body. And you realize how much you – how little control you have over, like, the, the media messages that you receive, like the advertising. I think is really key. I was walking actually down the street this morning uh, in New York and the um, – the the booths you know where they sell like the candy and gum and magazines and all of that you know on the street it wasn't even open yet but the side of it had all the the front covers of the magazines right. so you didn't have an i didn't even have a choice i didn't even have to buy one i was just walking down the street and there was l vogue um in style like all the all the magazines like the covers were right there i was like hmm that's perfect, perfect example of that. Uh, it's very true, but it ex absolutely played a played a role for me, especially once I was tuned in and heading down the wrong road. Um, it just, you know, exacerbated the the illness. Now, um, t tell me the story of Garen, this young girl who the the film follows. Just give me a brief synopsis if you can of her career. Uh, basically, I was at a fashion show in in Los Angeles, L.A. Fashion Week, and there was this black girl on the runway, a model that I thought was in her twenties. And a guy next to me remarked that, wow, I want to take that model home tonight. And the lady told him, well, if you do, you better be careful because she's 12. I was like, whoa. Her, her body was hanging out and, and all that. I was like, are you serious? They're sexualizing a child, huh? And it immediately reminded me of those Calvin Klein ads where they had them 10-year-olds and underwear. But I met her mom at that fashion show and told her what I was doing with the documentary, and she agreed to let me come and follow them. I followed them for like three years, actually. Basically, Garen's story is interesting because just prior to modeling, when she was 10, she said everybody used to call her giraffe and stick and beanpole, and she felt tall, skinny, and unattractive. Once she became a model on the runway dressed up for Tommy Hilfiger, she felt beautiful. Well, if you flash to the end of the film, and when she became a size four, you know, puberty set in, so I was four, and they told her she was seven centimeters too big to model anymore, and she couldn't model. That beauty that was given to her was now taken away, and that's how she ended up start feeling uh, ugly, even though she was, like, nowhere near ugly. That parallel, which is why I like her story in the film, is the same for the American public. If you buy into or let someone else tell you what beauty is and you buy into it, and, and that's where you get your self-esteem from, it could be taken from you at any time. Mm -hmm. So we have to develop our own value system and find out what's beautiful to us within us and only value that, not something externally. I, com I completely agree with that. That was a, a discovery that I made, and, and I think that a lot of people need to realize is that um, you can – beauty, how, how do we define beauty? That's a question that the film asks, and who defines it for us? And I, something that I talk about when I talk to young girls is going on a media diet, if you're going to go on a diet, and realize that you have control of the amount of media, you know, to some extent. You have a control um, over how much media you consume. You can turn off the TV and, like, go on a walk outside. Um, you can spend time with your family. You can have, like, family game night or do something else, something that 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 where you are listening to, to your heart and to your head and getting to know yourself internally and and we talk about you know true beauty to me is something that you offer um in the film something this is really cool anthony kiedis from the red hot chili peppers tells daryl that he has a beautiful handshake and he said well yeah you you have a beautiful handshake and daryl says that he gets and got so excited about that and then he just went around shaking everybody's hands for the next two weeks i'm running <laughs> around just shaking people's hands yeah but that's how you know it works right and it right. made you feel special and right. it gave you a feeling of self-worth but it also and i felt if, it was uniquely mine right, right right no one could take that away from you and right. that is so special about you and 
in that, in that beauty that you have, you are giving to someone else and you're making someone else feel good. Like I know when someone else gives me like a really nice hug or a a great handshake, you're like, yeah, like I feel good, you know? And so it's your unique beauty and you've offered it to someone else and you're giving and getting in return. And that is something that's true beauty to me, something that you can offer and that you receive something back in return. So it's something that reciprocates. Let me, let me ask you this, being a woman, um, the women, the 200 women that I told you about mm-hmm. that uh, was blaming the skinny, uh, the images of the skinny women in the magazines for mm-hmm. making them feel bad, and they s- just said they couldn't put it down. Why do you think women have this love affair with something that makes them feel bad? So as a woman, mm-hmm. why do you think that women cannot just put the fashion down, magazines down and go on this media diet that you're referring to? Right. Well, and it's not, you know, a refusing media to consume altogether. I just think that it starts from a very young age. And if you're just so used to something and it's convenient, um, I think logistically speaking, sometimes that's why you go to an airport. Oh, I need a magazine. Oh, what's right there? Okay, magazine. Pick it up. I mean, I think it's something that you get used to from a little girl. For me, for me personally, um, it was it was this desire to be perfect and to achieve perfection. And I constantly had to inundate myself with images that were something that I was not so that I could compare myself. Am I that way yet? Do I look like that yet? And compare yourself to the models in these magazines say, am I there yet? Nope, not there yet. You know, so that's what it was for me, why they can't put it down. Also, I think that, you know, you said we're hardwired to appreciate beauty. And there is a sense that as a woman, we wanna feel appreciated for our beauty. Now, of course, the question, what is true beauty? But we want to feel appreciated for our beauty because that's something that is unique. You know, it can be unique about us. You know, it can be unique because male and female are very different physically. So women have a different kind of physical beauty to offer. Um, And so I think women want to feel appreciated for their beauty. And so they constantly have to say, do I measure up? And um, that's and it's a destructive cycle, especially for those of us who are more, um, you know, goal oriented. I have to do X, Y and Z in order to achieve this for women who are more like that. It's it's even worse. Curzon, do you think that uh, perhaps um, the way that these magazines are sold and are marketed is as this secret information that will allow you to become more beautiful? Of Mm -hmm. course, it's really just like the end result is buy this cream but right. do you think that the, when when women and girls look at these magazines and they have these things on the cover like 20 ways to make yourself more beautiful mm, right. or a million takes on that do you do you think that um people actually think oh what if they have something in there that is something I don't know that I could learn and become more beautiful. Oh, absolutely. Absolutely they do. And like you said, there's two audiences of women. I really believe that. And there's the ones that will pick up that magazine and they'll flip through it and they'll enjoy it and they'll throw it out. And it won't it won't affect them totally. It won't cause them to have an eating disorder. It won't. Um, but then there are a lot more that will and will after three minutes start to feel depressed about themselves. Um, They'll look for that magic answer. They'll look for that magic secret outside of themselves when no one else can tell you how to live your life. Because half of those things, I mean, I, I find it when, you know, when I've done it before, like, oh yeah, let's see what that says, you know, open it up. And the way that they advertise it on the cover, like, the, the one secret to summer hair, you know, because your hair gets humid in the summer. I'm like, oh, great, you know, flip it open. I'm like, oh, that's not even good. I know about frizzies. Like, it doesn't work for me. <laughs> you know, so that, something that is like totally a letdown <laughs> anyway, you know, but it's just good marketing on the cover of that magazine. And it's not the secret. No one has the secret. And is it important? Like, is that the most important thing about your summer, that your hair doesn't get frizzy outside? It's like, no, I want to be out enjoying the beach. I want to be enjoying nature. I want to be having a good time. I want to, you know, be creating relationships and experiencing things. You know, so it's about what's important. But absolutely, oh, that is one huge thing. Like, we have the secret. You need this magazine to tell you how you're going to be happy. And it's just not the truth. Um. Now, because you actually uh, brought up a, a specific brand, uh, there was a question which I had watching the film, which was that um, you brought in a lot of advertisements and B-roll clips, and um, you know you took a lot of these uh, specific brand names, uh, L'Oreal, etc., and used them in your film. Uh, how did how, did they give you per- permission no. to use these images? No, no, they would never give permission um, under. 
copyright law, uh-huh. there's this thing called uh, social commentary, and mm. it's under fair usage. Mm. So it allows, well, the news use it all the time. That's why the news can say whatever they want to, uh-huh. and you can't sue them. Uh-huh. So for documentaries, there's this attorney, Michael Donaldson, mm-hmm. that got this thing uh, passed through Congress where social commentary is, you know, if you're critiquing something and you need the image to show what you're talking about, then you can just use it. But they won't give it to you. You have to get it off the Internet or wherever you can get it from, mm-hmm. but then it's fair usage to use it. And there's certain criteria with how long it can be and things like that, but it en- enables documentarians to, um, you know, proliferate. Michael Moore never could have done Bowling for Columbine and Fahrenheit mm-hmm. 9-11 if there was no fair usage laws. Yeah. yeah. Hmm. So uh, what do you think uh, some of these companies would think after they... Sorry, phone. I think when, uh, you know, the only one I think really, I tell you what, so you got to realize these people aren't really villains. See, unfortunately, a lot of people working in the industry are good people, They're people like too. us. They're people too. Every, people the the people. editor of one of the magazines in the film was at the, did you see Susan Schultz yeah, last yeah, night from, absolutely, Cosmo, from Girl? Cosmo Girl? She's Cosmo Girl. Cool. She was there last night. I was a little worried. Yeah. Cause, but afterwards, she like gave me a hug. She goes, oh my God, what you said was so true. And I hope this film really makes a difference. The guy from the E! Channel, he saw, you know what he did? The next day, he went on the E! Channel saying, you all have to go see this documentary when wow. it comes out. And he looks kind of nuts in it. So I've got a lot of support. The only thing I'm really, uh, I had a screening at Dove two weeks ago. Uh-huh. I flew out here. And uh, all the executives from Dove watched the film. The only person I think is really going to be uptight is Revlon. Because that was brutal. You know, <laughs> so you have the toxins in your cosmetics that a lot of organizations say causes breast cancer and allergies in women. But then you turn around and sponsor the breast cancer walk. Yeah. Companies don't really like that kind of publicity, so that'll probably be the worst reaction, <laughs> except for those plastic surgeons from Dr. 90210. So when we get to Los Angeles, I figure uh-huh. that'll be... Yeah. <laughs> oh, no. <laughs> well, uh, since, since you touched upon it, let's, let's talk about that a little bit, about um, plastic surgery. What's required uh, to per- for a doctor to perform plastic surgery? If I'm a doctor, I want to do some plastic surgery. What do I have to do? No, the only thing that's required uh-huh. is you have to have an MD degree. And I think most doctors have to have an MD degree to be a doctor. <laughs> so that's it. You just have to be a doctor. Uh, specialty. Right. Now, some uh-huh. of them, what they'll do, they'll take a weekend course. You don't have to. And they go practice on a tomato, on how to make incisions on a tomato on Friday, Saturday, and Sunday. Then on Monday, they're doing their first client. Um, that's it. I could I could not believe mm. that the medical profession did not have a safeguard in place that would prevent something like this. And then because it's cosmetic surgery, complications are not covered by health insurance, which I thought was really yeah, a it, great thing because it's cosmetic surgery. It's, it's elective. Yeah. So if something goes wrong something goes doing wrong. cosmetic surgery, you lose your regular insurance. So any complications that come from that surgery, you have to pay for it out of your bank account. You have no no insurance whatsoever. And so that's once again, so that's another thing I, I believe. So let's look at it. So eating disorders, now now it's different because men are getting it. Mm-hmm. Eating disorders are, were in the past primarily happened to women. So insurance companies won't cover it. Plastic surgery used to be primarily gotten by women if you look at it, I think this country still in 2008 mm-hmm. um, has this real violent disregard toward women. When things are primarily a, a problem that affects women, nobody cares. They don't cover it. But as soon right. as men come into the fray, if it's prostate cancer or anything, oh, yes. funding, funding, funding. You know, so that's, it's bad. It's pretty bad. I agree. I completely agree. And you're right. Things things like certain cancers that affected men more. And now, finally, I think breast cancer really broke down the door um, in getting awareness for, for more women's health issues and now heart diseases as well. But 
eating disorders as well is huge, absolutely huge. And I think this society and media sees it as, fr- as frivolous. And and still there's that stigma that eating disorders are a choice. And I think it was Carolyn Costin, she said at the end of the film that, yes, there is a little bit of choice involved. I think she said that, that she, as a, as a professional working with girls, that she said that she believed there was an element of choice. But it is a serious mental illness. And it demands, it should demand health health insurance coverage and um and i mean i just think that's it's, it's it is seen as a choice still and is frivolous and is vain but i think that that this film is is blowing down blowing down the doors on that one i think it's really causing people to see the truth of it um if if i could just uh switch gears here for a second um there was something which i, I know i know, which was touched upon in the film um Daryl, of course, you're an African American man, and um, Garen's black, and um, you go to uh, a certain. Is he is he a doctor? Is he a psychiatrist? I don't I don't know who this guy oh. is. No, he's he's a, he's a well, he he was a maxillofacial surgeon at okay. UCLA. He left there, and he became like one of the primary uh, beauty specialists okay. in the world. Actually, the way I found him is you know, and the BBC is not some frivolous news organization. They're one of the tops in the world. They did a one-hour special on him. He's been on the cover of the uh, New England Journal of Medicine. So he's like a renowned beauty expert. Okay. Um, he has some theories based off of Phi and the Fibonacci sequences where he developed his mask, where he puts it over your face. And the more closely al- your face aligned with these certain uh, points in the mask, the more people all over the world will find you um, attractive. Uh-huh. So I just wanted to say... So he's he has some credibility. So yeah, he's a beauty scientist and a maxillofacial surgeon. Mm. And 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 what did he say about skin color and beauty? Um, basically, no. Well, let, let's let's start at the beginning. So okay, let's start at the just beginning. to give him a little credibility, because uh-huh. I didn't know this. Growing up black uh-huh. in my community, the lighter skin, like the closer a black woman's skin color was to say Halle Berry's. Mm-hmm. They were considered more attractive than the darker skinned women. And I thought that was just in my community, in the black community. Doing this film, remember I interviewed the lady from Japan, Sri Lanka. I interviewed women from 45 countries wow. that said it's the exact same in their country. Mm. Lighter skin is more preferred. So we have to start off with the premise that it's a fact that in most countries, lighter skin is more preferred. Now you get to him. He said the reason is, is that hundreds and thousands of years ago, uh, the lighter your skin were, uh, was, the easier it was to detect disease from a distance. And it was easier to see that someone was healthy and that they were trustworthy because you, you could see if they was healthy. If their skin was lighter, there was no blemishes. He said the darker the skin, you could hide disease. And it was harder to tell if someone was, was healthy, th- therefore trustworthy. So that that was his premise on the light skin, dark skin thing. And do you buy that? I know, you know, <laughs> I'd be honest, I'd never heard it before. I had never heard that. And, and the only thing I won't do, because this guy, I mean, he's way far more researched than I am in that subject. So I'll just say, it sounds a little strange, and I'd never heard it before. Right. So, but without doing the research, uh-huh. I would not say, oh, that's just not true. Uh-huh. And if, and even if, if that theory holds. Hold some kind of credence or, or you know, s- substantiality. Um, but I think that we have come to a point where we have enough resources and we have enough tools and, and at least in our brains we have a frontal lobe and we have enough of a conscious as a society to say, okay, that may have been the case, but we know enough to get over that. <laughs> right. And, you know, and we can't always – Co- totally completely fight evolution or biology but we can make a conscious choice i mean we have our free agency as as human beings we have this wonderful thing called our conscious that makes us socially aware some people more than others i think <laughs> but you know we can make that choice and uh yeah he was a an interesting character but yeah. but you know what i loved i loved um kind of as a as a as a as a i don't know as something the opposite to that in the film, Eve Ensler from the Vagina Monologues. Right. She says that she had this conversation with a woman in Africa who said, you know, you you like that tree? You like that tree? Right. You know, is this tree ugly because it doesn't look like that tree? It's similar like that. Like, yeah, you can have this mask of what the perfect face is supposed to look like scientifically, but 
we appreciate each tree for its individual beauty, we need to do the same thing and celebrate our differences and celebrate body diversity and the fact that each someone has something uniquely beautiful about them, both externally and internally. Right. Yeah, and I think one of the things I found interesting, his name is Dr. McQuarrie, is to me his whole mindset uh, ran parallel to the beauty industry. So what he really was saying mm. is that this is what's beautiful because of this, and if you don't look like this, you need to do something about it to look to like this, yourself. which is what the whole industry is saying. So that's why I want that little parallel. And to me, it all boils down to intolerance, intolerance of difference. And I think that's one of the um, few things is really keeping this country from becoming the greatest country, you know, and probably the greatest country in the world now, but you know what I mean, an even greater country is our some of our unwillingness to, you know, to accept things that are different. He also had another theory, which is kind of interesting, that most people feel more comfortable to things that are closer to them. And he said mm -hmm. it, it goes from the macro to the uh, to the micro. So, for instance, if you and I were in Germany and I met you, and we'd be like oh my God, you're from America. That is so cool. And we would bond. Yeah. But if you and I were in California, then it's like, well, I went to, I go to UCLA and you go to USC and we're rivals. Right. So the smaller you break it down, mm -hmm. the more people feel comfortable within their little group. Mm -hmm. Kind of interesting. Mm -hmm. yeah. um, we don't have that much time left. So um, Kirsten, I, I really want to get, I, I, I know you're probably very well rehearsed in it, but I really want to get... Um, World peace. <laughs> <laughs> I'm kidding. <laughs> Sorry. Other people made that joke too. Um, <laughs> <laughs> um, no, but I, I really, I really want to get like, what, what do you say, you know, um, to, uh, I, I don't know how many young girls are listening, mm -hmm. um, but what do you what do you say to young girls who, who are looking at these magazines and who are getting these negative images and... How, how can you counteract that with a positive message? Well, first I say that that physical beauty that is seen in that magazine, first of all, it's not real. It's two-dimensional, and you're a three-dimensional person. You're a living, breathing human being, and that is just a photograph. And I know that's hard to see, but go onto the Dove website and watch that video of that girl being made up from the time she sits down in the makeup chair to the time you see her face on a bill billboard. And her neck has been lengthened. She's been digitally processed as well as airbrushed as well as X, Y, and Z. It's not real, number one. Um, number two, I think a great thing for young girls to know is is realize who you're looking up to. You know, think about people in your real life. I think that was a good, a good, a good message that Daryl said. Um, people in your real life, people that do things. Or if you're going to choose a celebrity to look up to or say, you know, why do I value these people? Choose someone who, if you're real into that, who maybe is stylish and also does something, has a message, has a voice, is a real woman and stands up for something, a cause. You know, I think a really cool role model um, is someone like Princess Diana, you know, someone like Oprah, who's a mover and a shaker and does things, you know, um, but Princess Diana, who champion HIV AIDS, you know, I mean, that is just women who do something in the world and have and use their actions and, and use those, those great things that they can do as women, those special talents and unique abilities that they have. I think it's really important to analyze who our role models are and who are the people we look up to. Okay, well, I guess we'll wrap it up right there. Um, the film is America the Beautiful. Um, Daryl, Kirsten, uh, thanks so much for coming on the program, and uh, I really appreciate it. And I hope everyone goes out and sees it and really takes away a positive message. Yeah. Thank you. It opens uh, August 1st at the uh, Cinema Village Theater on uh, 12th and University. Thank you. World peace. Yeah, yes, yeah, world peace. No, not. <laughs> thanks.